welcome back to the channel thanks for tuning in once again i got another great video for you guys today but before we get into the content of this video if you haven't already please like this video share the channel out and subscribe to the channel so today's video we're going to be looking at or digging into why Morris Americans wear the fez. We're not going to be digging into the actual history of the fez or where it comes from. We're just going to be looking into why Morris Americans wear the fez and why the leader of the Morris Science Temple, when he started the temple, used the Fez as a way to gain some respect from the powers that be. Now there were some things going on in the time period. The more the more Science Temple was started in the early 1900s. So as you know, in those times back in America, there was a lot of racism going on. So there was a guy named Timothy Drew. He had this idea to try to help his peoples get some respect by opening up what is called the Morris Science Temple of America. And with this, they were going to join the temple and gain some respect from the powers that be because racism was so rampant back then. So this is Timothy Drew. He's the founder of the Moore Science Temple of America. And one of the reasons for starting the temple was to uplift fallen humanity. Now in the early 1900s, racism was rampant. So he wanted to use this temple as an avenue to get better treatment for his people, for the American Negroes. Now we know the American Negroes were at the bottom of the totem pole. So what he set out to do was help them get some respect. So that way they could possibly be treated better, which is a noble act. You know, he wanted to help his people. So part of doing that, his members were to wear a Fez hat. Now we're going to be digging into what was going on around that time period and why they chose this hat. Now in the early 1900s, American Negroes were at the bottom of the totem pole because of racism. Now racism was uh, very ignorant and stupid ideology. So just because the American Negroes were at the bottom of the totem pole didn't mean that they weren't smart because they were in fact very smart. And in many ways, they figured out ways to trick the powers that be, the, the, the white Americans that were treating them bad. They found different ways to trick them into getting treated better. So we're going to look at a couple of things that was going on around the time period that helped these American Negroes pick the white, pick the whites to get better treatment in America. And that's them tricking the, the white Americans helped them get better treatment. And part of tricking them was putting on 
this hat. It was a situation where they needed to hide the wool. Now the wool, of course, is their hair. What they needed, what they sought out to do was hide the wool with the international headdress because they figured out that internationals, foreigners who look just like them, foreigners that were coming from other countries who look just like them were being treated much better than they were, the American Negroes. So pretty much if you were born in America, you were being treated bad. But if you were a foreigner, if you were a foreigner that looked just like these Negroes, they were being treated much better. Now, foreigners, we know, didn't dress like the American Negroes. So what these American Negroes had to do was adapt a foreigner look. And part of that adapting a foreigner look was putting on a foreign headdress. And that headdress that this man chose for his foreign look that he wanted his people to, to adopt, was the fads. So we're going to take a look at what was going on in the time, and I'm going to show a few examples of American Negroes adopting this foreign look. Now, the American Negroes that I'm going to show that adopted this foreign look, they weren't part of the Morris Science Temple. As I stated, Ameri American Negroes in general just figured out that they can trick the white Americans into thinking that they were foreigners. And Noble Ali took note of that. So this is part of the reason why he wanted his members, his members of his Morris Science Temple, to also adopt a foreign headdress. So now we're going to look at some examples of some American Negroes adopting the foreign look. Now this here is Reverend Jesse. We're gonna read his story. Turban and an accent equals white. As you can see, he's, he's wearing a foreign headdress. He's wearing a turban type thing. Reverend Jesse Wayman, Root, pastor of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, Queens, New York, found immense Emanci emancipation from Jim Crowism by renting a purple turban and affecting a slight Swedish accent, thus distinguishing Reverend Mr. Root toward the South last fall and was and was everywhere treated as a visiting dignitary. He had to watch his accent, he said, for otherwise he would have been late getting home. So what this reverend did was he put on a turban and he toured the country without being mistreated. This is the same reverend. Now, these are newspaper clippings. These are newspaper clippings of the Reverend, because this was a big story. He tricked the powers that be. Let's read this one. The jokes on Dixie. The Reverend Wayman Root, New York Negro clergyman, evaded Jim Crow when he traveled through the South recently wearing a rented turban, faking a Swedish accent, 
and getting himself everywhere courteously accepted as a visiting dignitary. He traveled in the white section of the segregated trains, ate in restaurants with whites, and was confidently told by officials how they keep the Negro in his place. Throughout his visit in Mobile, he was most cordially treated. Now, this man, this African, this American Negro, he put on a turban and was touring the country. He rode in the whites only cars. Now, as I stated, racism was a very stupid thing. So, Negroes were finding ways to trick the whites with their own stupidity. They hated black, they hated American Negroes, but they didn't hate other Negroes that were born outside of the United States. Now, the Negroes that are born outside of the, the United States, obviously they dress different. They dress as foreigners. They wear turbans and different type of attire. So what American Negroes were doing, they were putting on a headdress because as you know, a turban is a foreign look. So they were putting that on and fooling the whites and were being treated just like white people, which being treated respectfully. So as I was saying, Noble Jali, the founder of the Morris Science Temple, he saw that this was going on. So he adopted the same type of tactic for his, for his members. He made them put on a fast cap, a foreign cap, so that way they would be treated better and treated respectfully when seen walking around walking around in the town. So this is a way, this is one of the ways the American Negroes outsmarted the powers that be. So here we're going to look at another article, see what this one is saying. Queens Negro pastor in a turban gets white service in Deep South. Wearing a rented turban and speaking with a slight Swedish accent, a Negro clergyman of Jamaica, Queens, recently spent a week in Mobile, Atlanta and was treated by white civic, social, and political leaders like a visiting dignitary, he reported yesterday. Reverend Jesse W. Root, 39-year-old pastor of the Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, 109-14 New York Boulevard, gave this account of his reception in the southern city in an interview in which he said he had decided that in some parts of the South, they judge a man by the kind of hat he wears. Now you see, they judge a man by the kind of hat he wears. If you put on a foreign hat, you get treated better. Mr. Root combines his ministerial duties with professional appearances as a singer and painter and a pianist, and in his trip to Mobile was to fulfill several of these engagements and to lecture at a Negro church. He said he had visited Mobile in 1943 and on that occasion had been insulted and pushed around. The turban Mr. Root said came from a New York customer. He donned it and that he donned it and began speaking slightly Swedish. A few moments before he stepped abroad, a white passenger car of a segregated train in Washington, he declared thereafter, he explained he played his role successfully until he returned to New York. 
He said he ate at the train dining car table allotted to white passengers and also in restaurants in Mobile and in Montgomery, Atlanta, to which no Negro had ever been admitted. So you see, he was being admitted amongst the whites just because he had a turban on his head, just because they thought he was a foreigner. In one such restaurant, he said he asked a head waiter what would happen if a Negro came in to be served. He said the waiter told him that no Negro would dare come in here. It just stroked. It just stroked my chin and ordered my dessert, he recalled. His question in a similar vein to a mobile police captain bought, brought, he said this answer. If a Negro gives any trouble, we just knock him down. Mr. Root said that no one ever, and then it continues. So this is a newspaper clip. And so as you can see, racism, was such a silly thing. And it, it, it just shows that the powers that be, they, they only disliked American Negroes. If you were a foreigner, if you were of the same bloodline of an American Negro, but born on foreign soil, and didn't dress like an American Negro, they didn't have a problem with you. Now, this man is asking waiters, and you, you see what he looks like. He's clearly an African American or African Negro, as they would have, American Negro, as they would have called it back then. He's clearly an American Negro. That was the term they used back then. So only because he had on a turban and was able to hide his woolly hair, they treated him with respect. Now, as I stated, this is one of the reasons why when Noble Ju Ali started the Moor Science Temple, he made his members adopt a foreign headdress because he knew he would immediately get his members respect and better treatment than if they were just looked at as American Negroes. Put on a foreign cap, you get immediately treated better. Now, this is how silly racism is. Now, there were other, I'm going to put so this this right here is a cartoon because this was look october 25th 1947 so this was a known thing that was going on like it was i guess it was known but if nobody was actually checking to see if a person would have fez or a turban or if they weren't checking to see if they were really foreign born and they were able to just get away with it and were being treated much better than if they were thought to be of American Negro stock. Now, more Science Temple of America members, they adopt the ideology that their forefathers are from Morocco, foreign land. They also, I mean, when you talk to them, you you would think that they're from Morocco. But this was just the ideology that was used back in the early 1900s to help get by, to help being treated a little better. Put on a foreign cap and you'll immediately be treated better. Now let's take a look at this cartoon. Look at this guy with his feathers on. He got his glasses, smoking a cigar. Look at these, these ladies looking at them. It's called dark laughter. Now let's take a look at what the cartoon 
to say that's Bootsy and them other fools looking like United Nations folks. Bootsy says they can get in all the hotels and restaurants downtown because folks think they are foreigners. Now, you, as you can see, all an American Negro had to do at that time was trick the powers to be to think that they were foreigners and they would immediately gain respect. Now, I don't knock them. They, the, 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 the deck, it was stacked against American Negroes from day one. There were rules and laws enacted against them to stop them from gaining success in the United States. So they found loopholes and they used the powers that be on stupidity against them. So they were just doing what they had to do to get by back in them times. And I do not knock them for that. They had to do what they had to do. Let's take a, a look at another They fooled them too. Now this is an article of another Negro that did something similar. This guy right here, Kawawi. He did the same thing. He put on a turban and got respect. Let's take a look at his story. If you don't believe that bigoted whites who insist on strict segregation in the South are easiest to fool, the Reverend Jesse Root is the case in point. Now, this is speaking on the Reverend we just uh, read about. Brown skinned Dr. Root, who is pastor of Lutheran Church in Jamaica, New York, last week donned a turban for a tour of, of the South that reports that he treated, that he was treated like a visiting dignitary. In Mobile Atlanta, where he spent a week, he was able to meet white civic, social, and political leaders after I told them I was an apostle of human relations. Work like magic. Mr. Reverend Root, who speaks six languages, reported he adopted a Swedish accent for his Dixie tour and said that the turban worked like magic. But the Jamaica pastor is not the only one who has, who has found out that a man is edged often, is judged often by the kind of hat he wears. Eccentric Edgar G. Brown, head of National Negro Council. That's this guy. Now they're going to get into his story, I, I think. They were afraid. A leader in civic activities has fooled white bigots with his manner and appearance. Not, not too many years ago, Goaded Edgar was in Baltimore on a business and found himself with no place to stay, although another member of the delegation with which he was traveling were quartered at the largest downtown hotel. Worked for Edgar. Without thinking a second time, Edgar clad in white turban presented himself at the hotel desk, blatantly announced in an accent, in an accent tones that he had made previous reservations and I short order, and in a short order was showed to one of the better rooms. So when he first stepped in the hotel, 
with his compatriots. Let me see. Found himself with no. Not too many years ago, go to Edgar in Baltimore. Yeah, so he was traveling with some other people, and everybody he was traveling with got a room, but he didn't. So what he did was he spent out, put a white turban on, came back, spoke with an accent, told him he had reservations, boom, he gets a room. So this once again shows you that back in these times, in the early 1900s, American Eagles, they found a way to get treated better. They would put, slap on a foreign head, head dress, a turban, feds cap, and would be immediately treated better. The practice of passing of colored students as foreigners is an old one. You see, this is saying that this practice, it was pretty much known to the American Negro. This was something that they did. It helped them. Not too many years ago, a visiting lecturer at Columbia University recounted to a class how he had traveled unmolested through the South with a group of students of both races. We anticipated there would be trouble, he said, so we gave the colored students foreign names and identified them as African princes. We have no trouble and everybody was cordial. So you see, this is another story where some students were traveling, so they knew that they would, wouldn't be treated very well, so what they did was they acted like they were foreigners, told the people that they were around, that they were princes, and they were treated fine. Let me read that again. The practice of passing of colored students as foreigners is an old one. Not too many years ago, a visiting lecturer at Columbia University recounted to a class how he had traveled unmolested through the South with a group of students of both races. We anticipated there would be trouble, he said, so we gave the colored students foreign names and identified them as African princes. We had no trouble and everybody was cordial. Kawoni Castone, the human relations advisor, for many years wore a turban and recounted little or no trouble he entered into the Southland. Scared to ask. Because he is, I can't read that word, white sad an even harder time organizing themselves to question his identity. And he spent, and he went into the better places without incident. Proof that Bigoted whites don't really know when they have a real colored American on their hands can be found in the Florida murder, murder of a Dominican youth last December. Jose Adrian Tujillo Sayez, 20, was shot to death by Florida cop who mistook him for a colored American despite his protest his protest that he was from the Dominican Republic. He was, he is said to be related to the man who murdered the hairs of Doris Duke. In Puerto Rico, colored natives of the island may, may not, I think I said not enter certain restaurants and hotels because of their color, but have been seen colored Americans enjoying such facilities and nothing was said to them because they were continental in this case. It was not color that mattered, but the language one spoke. Okay, so in this, it's, it just also is showing you this trick was pretty much working outside of America as well. So when 
American Negroes were going to Puerto Rico, they were being treated better than the Puerto Ricans that looked like Negroes. And they were being treated better because they were foreigners. They were speaking English as opposed to speaking Spanish. Full of contradictions. Because this whole question of race relations fulfill out contradictions, it's all, always amuses me to hear of incidents where we put one over on them. It happens every day here in Baltimore. Just last week at a club meeting, a friend reported how she entered the biggest downtown store, which does not allow colored persons to enter unless they're shopping for someone or employed there and was fitted from, from skin out and served in the restaurant. No one looked at her twice. So that was another story of a Negro, American Negro putting on some type of headdress and being treated better. Now you see this guy, he, under his it says, Shahid Al Mahadi, Sudanese representative at UN. He's the real thing. So as you can see, they saying he's the real thing because he's really a foreigner. But as you can see, he looks just like an American Negro. And he has a turban on. So this this guy is pretty much who the American Negroes were imitating. You see, this guy was from the Sudan. So you see, coming from Africa, this is how he dressed. So the American Negroes were imitating this type of dress and were being treated much better because if you were a foreigner to the powers that be, you got treated with respect. So Moorish Americans adopted the same tactic. When the Moorish Science Temple was founded, Noble Jali told his members to put on that foreign headdress to Fez and you'll be treated better. Hide the wool with a foreign cap and you will be treated better. Now this is the story of of um of a woman acting like she was from India. I'm not gonna read this one, but you guys can pause this and see it. So as you can see, racism has no real foundation. People being hated for the color of their skin is not even really real. Because if you were a foreigner and you look like a Negro, you were being respected. If you had on a foreign headdress, if you could hide your, your, your woolly hair, they thought you were a foreigner and they were treating you with respect. Now, we're going to look at another example of a foreigner being treated with respect. Now, this, this example is from Booker T. Washington, something that he himself saw with his own eyes. This is coming from Up From Slavery, an autobiography by Booker T. Washington. Let's read it. It happened, I happened to find myself in a town in which so much excitement and indignation were being expressed that it seemed likely for a time that there would be a lynching. The occasion of the trouble was that a dark skinned man had stopped at a local hotel. Investigations, however, developed the fact that this individual was a citizen of Morocco and that while traveling in this country, he spoke the English language. As soon 
as it was learned that he was not an American Negro, all the signs of indignation disappeared. The man who was the innocent cause of excitement, though found it prudent after not to speak English. See, so as you can see, this man from Morocco, he was in a hotel, dark skinned man, and they thought he was an American Negro, but after investigations was made, it turns out that this man was from Morocco. He was here and he was speaking the English language. So after all of the excitement, he was like, nah, you know what? I'm not going to speak English no more. He went back to speaking Arabic because that is the language of his country. So speaking a foreign language could also show that you are a foreigner. Now, this is this, this is when Morse Americans see stuff like this. This is why they're so stuck on the they want to be from Morocco. This is why they make the claims that they're descendants of Morocco, because they see stuff like this and they see that Moroccan citizens were over here and get in respect. The, the only problem with them claiming that they're from Morocco is that they're not from Morocco. They're born here in America, so they're American. They're not Moroccans. They don't speak Arabic. They have a, United, a U.S. birth certificate. They have a social security card. So most Americans can't run around and act like they're from Morocco because they're not. It can be easily proven that they that they're Americans. Now, those type of mental tactics that were done back then to 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 get respect from the powers that be, those type of tactics are not needed in today's time. So acting like you're foreign born or you're from Morocco, there's no need for that because nowadays, foreign or not, when they see your skin, they see that you're an African American. They don't see, oh, I'm a Morris American. They don't care about that. They don't care. They know that you're an American, so they you're going to get treated like that. You're not going to get treated as a foreigner. You're not going to get any more respect as a foreigner. Like those type of tactics from the early 1900s, those are good tactics for back then, but those tactics are not needed now. Now, another reason why when the Moore Science Temple of America was founded by Noble Jew Ali, he adopted a Moroccan identity. He adopted the Moroccan identity because he knew that Morocco was respected by the United States. And when I say respected by the United States, the United States and Morocco had a treaty of peace and friendship. So it showed that Morocco was known and respected to the United States. So he wanted to say, hey, you know what? We're from, we're going to say we're from Morocco, which you're not. You really don't know where you're from because you are a captured slave. Your, your, your ancestors were captured in the Atlantic slave trade. So you really don't know which country you come from. Now, I understand why Noble Jolly chose Morocco to say that he came from there. I understand why he did that, because Morocco was respected by the, the United States respected Morocco. So they, they, he wanted to use Morocco as a place to say that that's where his uh, temple members came from. But as I said earlier, the problem with that is that can easily be disproved because the members of the Morris Science Temple of America are born in America. 
They're not from Morocco. Morocco knows nothing about members of the Moorish Science Temple of America. They have no records of you guys. You're not from Morocco. You guys are from America. Morocco knows nothing about you. But I spoke of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship with Morocco, so we're going to take a look at it. So let's take a look at the Morocco Peace and Friendship Treaty. We're not going to look at the whole treaty, though, because this treaty has mostly to do with, like, shipping and stuff of that nature. We're just going to look at a couple of clause from the treaty. Peace and Friendship Treaty sealed by the Emperor of Morocco, June 23rd, 1723, and delivered to America, to the American agent at Morocco, June 28th, 1786. Additional article signed and sealed on behalf of Morocco, July 15th, 1786. Shippings, signals, agreement signed at Morocco, July 6th, 1786. So as you can see, this is the treaty. And most Americans love to bring up this treaty. And I don't know why. Because this, this treaty is between Morocco and, <clears throat> and the United States. But the Moroccans that are part of this treaty are from Morocco. They're not just saying they were the citizens of Morocco. No, this treaty covers actual citizens from Morocco, which Morris Americans are not. Morris Americans are born in the United States. They are citizens of America. So bringing up this treaty does not help you in no way. Now let's take a look at this number six. If any more shall bring citizens of the United States or their effects to his majesty, the citizens shall immediately be set at liberty and the effects restored and in like manner. If any more, not a subject of these dominions, shall make prize of any of the citizens of America or their effects and bring them into the ports of his majesty, they shall be immediately released and they will then be considered as under his majesty's protection. I just thought that one was a little interesting. But as I stated, this, this treaty has to do with citizens of Morocco and the United States. And Morris Americans, you guys are not citizens of Morocco. No matter how much you want to be, you're not a citizen of Morocco, so you do not fall under this treaty. Furthermore, this treaty does not absolve you of crimes that are committed in the United States. This isn't a get out of uh, jail free pass. So even if a Moroccan citizen came over here and committed a crime, this treaty is not going to stop them from being arrested and detained and, and, trial, and, and tried. No, because you still have to follow, follow the laws of the land. If you're visiting from another country, you have to follow the laws of the land that you're in. Let's read number 16. In case of a war between the parties, the prisoners are not to be made slaves, but to be exchanged one for another, captain for captain, officer for officer, and one private man for another. And if this shall prove a deficiency on either side, it shall be made up by the payment of 100 Mexican dollars for each prisoner wanted. And it is agreed that all prisoners shall be exchanged in 12 months from the time of their being taken and that this exchange may be affected by a merchant or any person authorized by being authorized by either of the parties. If a citizen of the United States should kill or wound a Moor 
or on the contrary, if a Moor shall kill or wound a citizen of the United States, the law of the country shall take place and equal justice shall be rendered. The council assisting in the trial and in any delinquent shall make his escape. The council shall not be answerable for him in any manner, whatever. So as you can see, if a Moor commits a crime, and this one is specifically referring to murder, it is saying that the citizen Okay, the more shall kill a woman, the country, the United States, the country shall take place and equal justice shall be rendered. The council assists in the trial. If any, okay, so it's just, it's, it's pretty much, it's just saying that if, if you kill somebody, you, you're going to have to face a trial, the, the judge and the jury in that country, which will be the United States. It's not a get, this treaty isn't a get out of jail free type of thing. So I don't know why most Americans try to use that. Furthermore, if this treaty of peace and friendship between Morocco and the United States actually referred to you and you think that it's a get out of jail free pass, which is not, when this treaty was signed, right, back in 1786, all of the American Negroes of that time would immediately be, would have been let out of bondage. And that didn't happen. You know why that didn't happen? Because the American Negroes that were in bondage at that time the American Negroes that were enslaved at that time on the American soils, they aren't citizens of Morocco. Never have been, never will be. So this treaty of peace and friendship, it does not apply to Moorish Americans. This treaty of peace and friendship only applies to citizens of Morocco. And Morris Americans are not citizens of Morocco. Morris Americans are citizens of the United States. Morris Americans are born in the United States. So you are a citizen of the United States. So it really makes no sense for you guys to bring up this treaty when you guys get into some type of trouble. Like I, I see a lot of the times they bring up this treaty during traffic stops and things of that nature. Like, do you really think a treaty from 1786 is going to get you out of a, a, your speeding ticket? No, it's not. So, yeah, you guys need to, to stop it. But, as I said, the foreign headdress was a way to fool the powers that be. American Negroes figured out a way to fool the powers that be, and it helped them get along a little better in life. You know, American Negroes were at the bottom of the totem pole, so they had to do anything that would help them, that would help their lives. And Noble Ju Ali, the founder of the Moor Science Temple, he also knew that. He knew that he needed to do anything to help his people get better along in life. And in the early 1900s, which is the time he was alive, he saw what the Negroes around him were doing. The Negroes were putting on foreign headgear and being treated much better. So it's like, hey, why not do this? Why not adopt this trickery? The problem now, the problem that Moors Americans have now is though that they actually believe the trickery. They actually believe that they're descendants of Moroccans. And that is an issue. Like, Noah Jali just was saying that just to help his people get along and get treated better. But you guys are actually believing it. And that is an issue because you guys do not, there's no way for you to prove that 
your descendants of Moroccans. Your your ancestors were captured slaves that were brought over here in the Atlantic slave trade. So you have no ties, no 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 oral history, nothing that can tie you back to an actual tribe or nation like you saying you're from Morocco, that's just something that you're saying. That's not anything that you can prove. That's just, that's something that you believe. But that's not nothing that you prove that you can prove. Now, your beliefs are your beliefs, but your beliefs aren't facts, and your beliefs cannot be proven. And your beliefs, like you, you get you guys got a little twisted along the line somewhere, and you start trying to morph history and start using treaties and things of that nature to try to get yourselves out of trouble. And it's, it's, it's just wrong and it's, it's just false. You guys need to stop it. You guys have nothing to do with this treaty. You're not a citizen of Morocco. You're citizens of the Americas and, and that's it. So, like I said, American Negroes needed a way to get treated better, and they found that way, and they used that, and they used it. And the Moore Science Temple of America adopted it. Now, this is why they, they chose to put on a foreign head headdress. They chose to put on the fez to make them look like they were internationals so that they can get treated a little better. So this is part of the history on why Morris Americans are now, even to this day, wearing a foreign headdress. <laughs> Hey, let's go. Hey.